this uh, exhibition came about through my opportunity of, to have worked with all three of these artists before. So I knew a little bit about them and their work and I liked it very much and thought what they were involved in, what the issues and they were concerned with and the ideas that they were exploring were very thought-provoking. And um, so I was asked to do an exhibition for en Enclave in London, which is a new space that uh, is being opened in the summer. And I was thinking about what I might do, and it's always very helpful to be able to think back, rather than trying to pluck artists out of thin air, but to think back to artists one has had some experience of in the past. And with Taos and Ava and Neha, I had been working with them quite recently, over the last 18 months or so. So they, are, they were among some of the artists who were in, um, in my thoughts. And then it struck me that there was something similar about all, all three of them, although their work superficially appears to, it looks very different. But there was something, they did have uh, something in common, and that was to do with the fact that each of them in a different way thinks about themselves as individuals, or as us as individuals, and our relationship with other people or groups of people, societies and so on, in the world in which we inhabit. And then I came across, just by chance, this quotation from Louise Bourgeois about her work being to do with this duel between the individual and the group. And when she said that, she was talking about herself and her relationship with her family. But it seemed to me that this relationship between the individual and the group is expressed in, in different ways and in fact these three artists who are, who are being shown here were all involved in that um, to some extent. And the title of one of the sculptures that Louise Bourgeois made uh, was called, is called Quarantania. And so I stole the title of that work and used it for the title of this exhibition. So that's where we are now in this part of the gallery. And it's quite group shows are, are much more. I, I find, from a curatorial point of view, group shows are much more complicated to do than solo shows because not only do you have to, <coughs> does one have to absorb oneself in in the work of the each, in, each individual artist and try and get under the skin of it and, and really find out what the substance is it, of it is for oneself. But one's also got to build a relationship between the three artists, or however many artists in the show. Whereas when you're working on a solo show with an artist, that bit um, obviously doesn't crop up. So what we've decided to do here was to try and, as fairly as possible, um, allocate a space in, in the gallery for each of the three artists. So rather than mixing their work together, we've given them each a, their own sort of semi-autonomous presence within the gallery. And here we are, at the start of the show, with, um, in, in Taos Maka Jeva's room. Um, what I've said in, in, in the catalogue, really, is, is that Taos comes from a particular um, background, from a particular um, ethnic group in the, what was the old Soviet Republic. The old, sorry, sorry, the old Soviet Empire, get that right, um, Dagestan. And a lot of your work is to do with the relationship between that um, ethnic grouping, you might say, and the wider um, world in which it inhabits and you inhabit. Is that, that right? Yep, yeah, that's um, absolutely right. And I think well, we're just standing uh, in front of the, 
plinth with jewelry from the project Portrait of Avar. It's uh, <coughs> Avar is my kind of minority, my nationality basically, and um, it's kind of connected to the four monitors that you see. It's a documentation of a performance where I wore a traditional, uh, my tr traditional kind of um, dress, but it's usually it's, usually it's kind of blue or red color, but this time it was flesh color, and I made like copies of 19th century jewelry uh, of like traditional Dagestani jewelry and I wore it as well so I guess I was thinking about identity and whether you can wear an identity or whether it's something that you've worn in and um, I walked the streets of, of Moscow in this costume and I guess the political connotations of it there's a lot of sort of right-wing movements um, against people coming to Moscow getting work I mean I, I think it's a familiar story for every um, country so these were political con connotations for it because I definitely walking in Moscow in this dressed the way I was. I was the, the ultimate author. The ultimate author that <coughs> everyone is um, scared of, I suppose. Well, especially in Russia, especially in Moscow. So why did you choose to make that costume in, in, a, in a flesh color rather than use the traditional yeah, colors? It, it's because, I don't know, it was sort of, is it part of the, my body, what I'm born with? Is, is this identity or is this identity just uh, a thing that you put on and take right. off whenever it's convenient? Um, so that was the reasoning, and that was the reasoning um, that I made this jewelry from liquid latex. And but recently, I've been interested in sort of exploring other communities as well. I've um, came across this um, illegal street races community in um, Dagestan, um, <coughs> and that's where I made the video. And then I was well, when it, since um, I came back to Russia after my BA, I was thinking a lot. Um, I was looking how Russia is overflowing with like massive cars, massive four by fours, which is completely irrational because it's not a farmer's country. It's it's just kind of an extension of ego or I don't know. Yeah, it has to do more with power than with a necessity. And then I was watching a lot of adverts of how these massive cars are sold. And my favorite one is a cage in a desert, and then it opens, and then this massive four by four kind of runs into the desert and goes around the dunes and it's it's like a wild beast so you can purchase this wild beast with a certain amount of money or you can even become this wild beast like through purchasing this car and i guess i want to return some sort of bestiality to it and um, uh, with this work i've collected old soviet fur coats in a flea market <laughs> in moscow and made this massive furry cover for this four by four and went into these illegal street races and then into car market as well, kind of trying to, uh, in a way, I don't know, penetrate the society environment. But the car was enough. I didn't need another license for it. Um, and it was very important that it's kind of, it's used fur coats, Soviet fur coats, because there was this really big tradition of reusing fur coats in Soviet Union and uh, recycling them. If you were lucky enough to acquire one, it kind of passed on to your daughter, your granddaughter, it was always been modeled, but now they're just sold for six pounds in flea markets, so it kind of have no value with new culture. I so tell us a little bit about, um, the, the car racing thing is an almost exclusively male yeah. preserve, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And you were, uh, attempting to uh, engage with that as, as a woman and um, as somebody who was outside of that particular culture, although it's kind of subculture within your yeah. own. Yeah. yeah. So could you tell us a little bit about how you saw your relationship um, on an individual level with this, with this subculture? Um. I don't know, I, I just um, came across it uh, through my friend and I was just, I'm, because I'm interested in kind of this divide and this gender divide with sort of male and female society in Dagestan because it is a traditional Islamic republic and uh, it was, uh, for me, it was a way of kind of a, an attempt to critique, uh, critique it as well, as well as sort of interact with it. But uh, unfortunately, I think um, everybody uh, took it as a kind of really new cool way to soup up a car <laughs> yeah. rather than, you know, <laughs> kind of being critical about it. Mm. So When you say everybody, who do you mean? Well, I mean the, the, the audience yeah, that, yeah. Put, that sort of saw this performance, yes. if, um, <coughs> if you called it that way, because I think it, it is a performance for me, it's not a film. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't, I'm not sure if that answers your question. No, I, I think <coughs> what, what, what was interesting about this for me was the way in which you are part of this sort of ethnic 
group, if you like. But never, nevertheless, although you're inside it, you're outside it. You're outside this particular part of it, yeah. and how you engage with that. Uh, I think it's very, very interesting. Because because the car to me seemed to be feminized in a way because it's got this kind of soft surface, and whereas and it's in this compound with all these very sort of shiny and bright and tough cars. So I, yeah. no, I quite like that that association. Yeah, no, I think a lot of uh, people did say that they associated with a woman. Yeah. And sort of me. Yeah. Because there are hardly any women in this film at all. Yeah. I mean, I think you see one or two. Yeah. yeah. But the one, the, the piece that I think illustrates this group individual um, most poignantly is this um, piece here, which is called Reckon, um, which has been shot up in the mountains and shows somebody covered, completely covered in um, a, a shepherd's sheepskin coat, attempting to bond with this flock of sheep and goats. So perhaps you could tell us. Yeah, yeah. Some it's, um, I used uh, an old um, sheepskin uh, coat um, uh, called Timug that was usually worn by shepherds in Dagestan, but it's no longer used because it's just inconvenient and too heavy. And um, a performer, it's not me this time, is sort of crawling in it and trying to sort of interact um, with the sheep and trying to be accepted <coughs> by the sheep and become part of the community. But well, fails, um, I suppose. So <coughs> I guess the, the idea is um, quite simple to be kind of, what, what are you ready to do to be accepted by a community? Are you ready to get down on all fours and sort of wear uncomfortable clothes? This is Eva Kodatkova, who I should say had an opening of another exhibition of her work in Dusseldorf last night, has got up extremely early in the morning to get here with very, very little sleep. So I'm not going to tax <laughs> Eva with so much to give an account of her work. You are very kind. <laughs> <laughs> but um, where do we start with this? So, so the relationship between the individual and the group in Eva's work is um, bound up uh, with ideas about control and authority and the way in which the individual can function or be constrained within um, society. I think that's about a, a, a reasonable way of putting it. I would say this is a really exact <laughs> okay. description, so it's really hard to add something, but, but uh, should I maybe talk about the yeah, you, pieces which yeah, yeah. the, 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 yeah. the, the Oh, well, I would really Can I just say one thing? So, yeah. so all this, the, other, the other thing to bear in mind about Eva's work is that she creates, she, she's making things all the time, and they come together in different combinations. So sh she might have um, an idea or, uh, for a particular piece and create a body of objects around that idea, but they can equally then expand or contract given the circumstances or the conditions in which they're shown. And these works come from um, one particular body of work called Work of Nature, which is a much, which is much more extensive. Anyway, that, so that's just that's a little bit of background. So perhaps I start with this yeah, one because be this is actually just a segment of a bigger scale installation, which was actually filling one entire space, which was like 16 to 16 or something like that. And uh, it was a combination of, of drawings and then these metal elements, uh, which were displayed in, in uh, this kind of uh, archive-like or data database-like uh, manner, so that you would just see this kind of storage of, of um, uh, either complete or fragmented items, which can either be used uh, by a person. You can, you can see some steps on the ground. Uh, so you can actually use some of the metal devices, or there are other some uh, three-dimensional um, uh, three um, um, realizations of some of some uh, drawings from from geometric books, from from uh, yeah yeah from educational books or from mathematics. Um, uh, so actually, there the people were supposed to walk through the space and and uh, uh, interact a little bit with the objects, which is not allowed here, but but uh, because the objects are a little bit dangerous, but. But uh, this this was the the, the purpose, and uh, 
I very often connect, as you say, the, the, the three-dimensional three things and, and props for the body or some sculptural elements or architectural elements with, with some other outputs like drawings or sketches. So uh, when you walk through the exhibition, even so, the, the, all of these uh, elements are from different series or even from different years, I would say they are very much connected or linked together. You can actually find many, many motifs which are repeating themselves uh, in the exhibition, either on the sketches over here, on the on the shelf, or or in the actual um, um, in the in the central installation. So these drawings that are on the wall on these shelves here are, are like um, blueprints for exactly. for the the sculptures <coughs> that, that are produced, but they are also um, very intriguing diagrams diagrammatically in, in in their own right aren't they so they they how, how does the relationship work between the the preparation of these drawings and then the preparation of this sculpture which comes first or does or do they go I hand in hand i think it's really difficult to divide it actually i wouldn't really put such a, a, a strict hierarchy between the the, the works uh, even so I, I i take them as sketches very often i also take them as final results or or, or uh, things which i'm presenting at the end and i would say in this case it's it's a um, kind of again archive like display so so you can actually always just see some fragments of the motives uh, you can to see the complete drawings so you, you just feel that there are some some motives or some some ideas for some maybe upcoming projects or upcoming uh, installations layered uh, above each other so i would say that the, the connection is very direct it's it's uh, there is no uh, nothing could be more important than the other or, or, yes. or and you've done many hundreds of these drawings yes i you? draw every day yes yes so drawing is kind of fundamental to, to what you do. Yes, yes, yes. It's a kind of connecting link between the projects I, yes. I do. And then the photographs are on the wall over here are from two bodies of work. They are, from, they? They are from the year uh, 2009 and 2010, and it's a series which is called House Arrest. Uh, and then a series which is called Control Memory Loss. And it's a Control uh, and Memory Loss. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a um, uh, body of work which um, um, I originally planned as a kind of performances or something but will be actually I will be exploring or I will be testing some of these devices uh, personally which I also did but then I decided that somehow the static photo or the static representation of the situation is maybe more powerful or it's more expressing what, what, what I wanted to say uh, so there are for example um, uh, these devices, uh, there is the, the, just to start from the right uh, um, uh, side, there is this reading device which is actually quite uh, heavy to carry, so it's not only a very difficult um, um, educational tool, which is not really practical at all, but rather tor torturing the person, but it's also very hard physical exercise to, to, to just simply stand in, the, in that position and carry this heavy structure on it. There is this very <laughs> um, the upside one, yes. <laughs> one, and then there are some some others, like for example the uh, the mm, uh, photograph of these uh, tables, which are which are piled up on each yes. other in this hierarchical uh, position. This was actually an installation done uh, in a gallery, and it had interactive elements to it. So uh, there were some children invited, and they were um, uh, supposed to behave according to certain scripts or according to certain instructions on the structure. So uh, they had to fulfill certain tasks before they were able to climb up to the top. So, yeah. all, so what maybe one of the underlying things in all this is that in order to learn in an orthodox way, or in order to acquire knowledge in an orthodox way, one has to go through all kinds of constraining mechanisms. That's and that uh, perhaps there are freer alternatives in, in the way in which we absorb information and absorb knowledge. No, I would, I would agree to that. I mean, uh, there are not such a, uh, possibilities in Czech Republic at the moment in the ed educational system, unfortunately. <laughs> it's still quite hierarchical and quite strict, so that's actually maybe also something I'm referring to a little bit in, in, in the work, that it's also maybe connected with the, with the edu educational systems in, 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 in my country and how I experience it personally. I was going to say, how, how, how much does this uh, relate to your own experience i would say it is i mean it's it's um it's uh, hard to say how directly because uh, of course some of the works maybe seem a bit uh, uh, traumatic so i have to say i was always rather an observer of the situations than a victim yes. of some so you're taking <laughs> so things to a, to an extreme um in, in order to make that in order to make that point yes 
So what about this wonderful piece at the end here of the chaise longue and the, uh, with the book? Mm. Well, this, the, I should say the book that's um, on this uh, stand is a history, a history of flight, isn't it? So it's as if whoever is um, imprisoned in this chamber, in this reading chamber, is reading about a, their means of escape, which is an impossible. Something, yeah, something impossible. Or yeah, yeah. Uh, well, this is actually a, uh, an object which which uh, which is a part of a bigger scale uh, series of works, which is called Parallel Biography, and uh, it was based on uh, the idea of a. Um, uh, or, or on a fictive story of a person who is uh, building uh, a sort of parallel biographies or parallel identities to be able to survive in the society or to fin fit into certain social structures where it's just hard for him to to to, to become part of or, or something like that. So this was one of the uh, segments of his um, fictive room, or if I should call it this way. Uh, it was actually also used by some people. It's not used anymore, but but you can actually go inside and 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 uh, read the book. And uh, it was just again. Well, you can. You can actually. You can. Uh, yeah. You can actually open this one. Yeah. Should I try? Should I? Oh, I see. No, it's okay. All right. <laughs> right. I so I don't know if anybody <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> likes the idea of that. Very yeah. <laughs> My work in my head was initially really about the self and the various um, aspects of the self that I could explore through my relationship with the material world around me. And uh, this is an excellent forum in which to ex re-examine that in a way for me. Um, in about, I think when I was still an undergraduate in college, I'd made a work in which I'd painted over a plant for a painting class. Um, precisely uh, such that it just looked like a healthier version of itself. Um, and, um, you know, it was both a landscape, a sculpture. It obviously had uh, things to do with uh, the m material inside and the substance outside, uh, the, the, uh, the skin that covers it, that both 